And you know, when I think about the story of Joseph, I thought about another story that I heard this week. Um, There was a man who went rock climbing. Don't understand why people go rock climbing, number one. I have a huge fear of heights, can't stand being up high. But secondly, there are people who go rock climbing without any straps at all. To me, that is insane. Well, one guy slipped, and as he fell down the side of the mountain, he grabbed on to some roots. It was just a, a little tree that had sprung up on the side of the mountain, and the roots weren't very deep. And he grabbed a hold of it, and he cried out to God, God, will you help me? And he heard a voice that came back. And God said, let go of the branch. And he waited for a second and he said, is there anyone else? (laughs) And that is absolutely true, is it not, when it comes to our trust with God? Sometimes we feel like God is calling us to let go of the branch. And we're like, that's not an option that I really want to pursue. Well, imagine Joseph trusting in God all along through this horrific journey of a terrible family, the death of his mom, He's crying out for God's help, probably in his own mind, but yet he never loses this element of trust. And so if you have your Bibles, we're going to start right here in Genesis chapter 39. We're going to start reading together in verse 1, and here's what it says. Now Joseph had been taken down to Egypt, and Potiphar, the officer of the Pharaoh, Pharaoh's number one in charge, captain of the guard, an Egyptian, bought him from the Ishmaelites who had taken him down there. And the Lord was with Joseph. I find extreme comfort in this. That here is a young man that tries to live life according to the book. We saw last week how he was utterly faithful to his father, not just his earthly father, but also his heavenly father. And that even when his father asked him to go to a group of men, his own brothers who despised him, he chose not just to trust his father, he chose to obey his father. And when he didn't find his brothers... He went the extra mile to to, to carry out his mission. And so he didn't give up because he's faithful, because he obeys. And here we see in this passage of scripture, even though Joseph gets the short end of the stick in life, the Bible says the Lord was with Joseph. And let me tell you something, brothers and sisters, if the Lord was with Joseph in moments like that, God is with you in moments of your valleys, in moments where you're in the pit, in moments when you feel abandoned by God, Because God is creating a story. He's carrying out his purpose. He has a plan. And it goes on to say that he was a successful man. And he was in the house of his master, the Egyptian. And his master saw that the Lord was with him and that the Lord made all he did prosper in his hand. And so Joseph found favor in his sight and he served him. And then he made him overseer of his house. So here is Joseph 17 years old when he gets sold into slavery, goes through the chain of custody, ends up excelling in the position that he's appointed to, even to the point where now he is second in rank in the entire kingdom. He is the right-hand man of the most powerful man in the known world at that time, and that is Pharaoh over Egypt. And the Lord was with him, and the Lord guided his hand. Now here's often probably one of the most frustrating points in Christianity, as when we do try to understand the will of God or the plan of God, we often mistake one aspect of God's plan or his will for another. God has what's called a providential plan. These are ways and things that God is directly involved in the human course of history. God causes specific things to happen. He prevents other things to happen. And this is God's direct hand involved. That is the providential will of God. But then there's also the permissive will of God. Where even though God isn't instrumentally involved, he permits and he allows things to happen. For instance, God allowed Joseph to be sold into slavery by by his brothers. God allows loved ones of us to pass away or get sick. God allows us to go through the tough moments of life. That doesn't mean God is out of control, but it does mean that God permits suffering and evil. But here's what we know about Joseph's situation, is that even though he went through something that was difficult and tough, he's experiencing something that is overwhelmingly good. And that's what the Bible says in James. The Bible says that all perfect goodness, goodness, every perfect gift comes from God. And so isn't it good when things are going well for us? Don't we like it when things go well? Our relationships are working, we're succeeding at our job. Life just seems great. It's going well. And we're like, man, I must be doing something right. Another mistake. You see, God doesn't call the rain 
and the sun to shine on people who are good and who are evil, people who are right and wrong, God causes rain to shine both on the good and the bad. And so in this permissive will of God, just because things are good for you doesn't mean you're necessarily doing something right, but just because things are bad for you doesn't necessarily mean you're doing something that is wrong. God is working out his plan, sometimes rarely through providence and through his control, while other times through his permission, taking into account the free will decisions of everyone around us. And so God is at work. Goodness is happening to Joseph right now. And you know, when I think about the good things in my life, the best part of my life is my family, my faith. I I really enjoy football. I was raised on football. It's something I look forward to every year. It's not the center of my universe, right? But it's definitely something that I enjoy. Uh, Experiencing a delicious meal, going out to a movie. I mean, all of these good things, they come in harmony and life just seems to go great. But goodness only lasts for a season, And if you've lived any amount of life, you know that there are good times and there are bad times. And so look what happens to Joseph. Things are going great. And then the poor guy just can't get ahead of the game. God allows him to go through something again. Look what it says here in verse 6. Starting with verse 5, it says, So it was from that time that he made him overseer of the house and all that he had. And the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house for Joseph's sake. What an incredible thing. And the blessing of the Lord was on all that he had in the house and in the field. And so God's hand is providentially involved in Joseph's life because God is working out a plan through Joseph. And look what it says starting in verse 6. It says, Thus he had left all he had in Joseph's hand, being Pharaoh. And he did not know what he had except for the bread which he ate. Now Joseph was handsome in form and appearance. Not to brag or anything. But the guy's good looking. The author is basically saying, you all thought I was going to make a reference to me, didn't you? (laughs) Thought about it. (laughs) But then the Bible also says not to lie. So, no, he he is tall, dark, and handsome, in other words. He's setting up the story for a narrative to introduce the purpose of the next part of Joseph's story. But here's the deal. Prosperity sometimes comes into our life, and we should enjoy it, but we should also understand it is short-lived. Anything could happen to your 401k. Anything could happen to your health. Anything could happen to your loved ones. Just because things are going great doesn't mean they always will go great. In fact, it's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. And we as Christians must align our theology and our perspective on life so that we can go through the difficult circumstances, just like Joseph, with absolute faithfulness. That's what God is calling us to. And so look what happens in verse 6. Starting in verse 7. We already read verse 6. It says, And it came to pass after those things that his master's wife cast long eyes at Joseph. I don't even know what that looks like. You know? How do you (laughs) sit How do you seduce somebody with your eyes? I think it's really just a, a way of saying that she was flirting with him. Right? But it started with the eyes of seduction. And so here is this good looking guy serving the most powerful man in the world, and his wife is starting to long after this young, upcoming, good looking guy who's smart and witty and skillful and recognizable. All the things that you would want in a man are in Joseph, and Joseph is about to step into a hot pot of mess. And God's going to let him go through it. Look what it goes on to say. And it came to pass after these things that his master's wife, casting long eyes on Joseph, she said, lie with me. Commit adultery with me, in other words. What a terrible circumstance to be stuck in if you're a man of morals, if you love God and you love people. And it said, but he refused and said to his master's wife, look, my master does not know what is with me in the house, and he has committed all that he has to my hand. There is no one greater in this house than I, nor has he kept anything from me but you, because you are his wife. How then can I do this great wickedness, and look at this, and sin against God? You see, for Joseph, the bigger part of his story isn't messing with other people's lives, isn't wrecking homes. Ultimately for Joseph, he is living in such a way where he brings God into the picture. This isn't just sinning against this man that trusts me. This is sinning ultimately against God. And that's what sexual sin is. It's not just about, well, you'll get pregnant if you have sex before marriage, or you'll get a disease, 
or something bad may happen. And instilling fear in our culture, it's about this. Sex outside of God's design and plan for us is ultimately sin against him because we are telling God, God, I am casting a vote for a different universe. What you have created and designed does not work and I don't trust it. I'm in control. What I say goes. And Joseph knew that having sex with this woman was sin against God and he did not want to do it. What an upstanding guy. I mean, you think about our culture And the majority of men, if they had the opportunity to lie with an attractive, powerful woman, they probably would. And they probably wouldn't care. But God is calling us to his side. He's calling us to his plan. It is God's will for your life to remain sexually pure. Not to be abstinent. Sex is great. It's created by God. It's a wonderful gift. I mean, we could make things really uncomfortable this morning if we wanted to. But we'll just leave it at that. Sex is a good thing to be enjoyed in the way that God designed it to be enjoyed. But nevertheless, here's Potiphar's, or Pharaoh's wife, trying to seduce a man who loves God and loves people and to jack up his plan. But Joseph says, no, I need to follow God. Let's keep going on through the story. Look what also it says. So it was after she spoke to Joseph day by day that he did not heed her to lie with her or to be with her. I mean, day in and day out. Can you imagine going to work every single day and having somebody try to seduce you? Ladies, can you imagine going to your job every single day and being sexually harassed? And many of you are like, been there, done that. But think about this. Usually this was a male-dominated society. I mean, usually men are the ones who are more provocative and women are the ones who are more defensive in this culture. But yet the scroll was flipped. Here Joseph is the one being pursued by Pharaoh's wife. And so this is a classic case of somebody just trying to bully someone to get what they want. It's, It's sexual assault. Constant. Every day. And you know what? There are people in this room who battle the temptation of pornography every single day. The woman or the man is whispering through that screen, come lie with me. Come have me. This is so much better than what you're not getting at home or what you're not getting as a single person or what you're not getting in your relationship. Come lie with me every single day. But yet God has a plan. And what is God's plan for Joseph? that he wouldn't face sexual temptation? No, that if he does face sexual temptation, he would choose to do the right thing. And so look what the story goes on to say. But it happened about this time, verse 11, when Joseph went to the house to do his work and none of the men was outside, uh, that, was out, that was of the house was inside. Really bad situation when you're alone whether it's a computer screen or another woman, when you are alone, you're setting the stage for disaster. I've made mistakes like that in my ministry, and thanks be to God, no one brought false accusations against me or charges against me. And it's really hard being in the ministry or just being a person not to be alone with another individual of the opposite sex. But here at Severn Christian Church, our policy is no one-on-one counseling without other people in the office. We don't want to meet with other members of the opposite sex because we don't even want that being projected onto us as if something is going wrong. And so if there are counseling sessions that are, that are prescribed, it's always written on the books. Nine times out of ten, there are other people in the office. But this is a general wisdom that's applied in ministry. This should be some general wisdom that we take into our own lives, especially for those of you who are married. Do not be alone with the opposite sex. It sets a really bad picture, but it also opens up the door for temptation. And so the stage is set. Whether or not Potiphar's wife dismissed everyone or it just happened by circumstance, here is Joseph stuck alone. And look what takes place. And she caught him by his garment saying, lie with me. But he left his garment in her hand and fled and ran outside. What's with this guy in jackets? You know what I mean? It's like, dude, stop wearing coats and maybe you won't get into trouble. I had that thought this week. But this poor guy, she lunges at him and seizes him to grab him onto her. And this guy does the absolute right thing. He takes off and he runs in the other direction. And that's our attitude towards sexual sin. It's not something that you just want to entertain or take a chance with. It's something that you want to run away from in the opposite direction. Get out. And here's what I thought about when it comes to God's plan for our life is, look, When God is present and things are going good, we're like, wow, God, you are creating a wonderful plan for me. But man, when things are going bad, we recognize this. Bad things can happen. 
And here's the deal. The Lord was still with Joseph this entire time. And here's what God's presence does for us. It gives us the freedom to choose. We can choose whether or not we fall into temptation or not. That is not outside of the realm of our free will. One of my favorite passages of scriptures in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, it says this, the temptations in your life are no different from what others have experienced. Joseph lived thousands of years ago. He's going through the exact same stuff that we go through. These things don't really change. Other people have gone through what you're going through, guys. You're not alone. If your marriage stinks, you're not the only marriage that's broken. If you're struggling with sexual temptation, a lot of other people have been there. Whatever it is that you're going through, other people have been there. And look what it says. And God is faithful, and he will not allow the temptation to be more than what you can stand. When you are tempted, he will show you a way out so that you can endure. And here's the encouragement that I take from this. Whenever I enter a moment of temptation, I know through the power of the Holy Spirit, I can overcome this situation or this circumstance. I can choose to beat this thing with God's will on my side with God's spirit on my side. And so can you. You have the power to defeat sin. That's the whole point of the Holy Spirit. And that is a battle we should all engage in. Will we mess up and make mistakes? Absolutely. That's why God gives us forgiveness and grace. But we're still called to fight against sin. God provides a way out and it's through the power of choice. And so what does God want us to choose? What is his plan for our life? What is God's plan? And you can't really get any more clear than this. Look at what 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 says. It is God's will that you should be sanctified. You should be holy. And notice this clarification, that you should avoid sexual immorality. That's what God wants for your life. Last week, if you remember the scripture that we ended with, what is God's will for your life? Joseph is in the bottom of the pit getting sold into slavery. In all circumstances, give thanks. Give thanks to God for what you have, for who you are, for whose you are. And now we notice from this week, what is God's will for your life that you should abstain from sexual morality? Now, does that apply only to adults? Nope. It applies to our students. It applies to those who are more experienced and seasoned in life. Sexual temptation doesn't end later on in life. It doesn't. And for those of you who are in that stage of life, you know exactly what I'm talking about. It doesn't end. The battle starts in the mind. And Jesus says this, if you lust to commit adultery with a woman in your heart, you've already done it. And so just because the body might stop working doesn't mean the mind ever stops. Sexual temptation never goes away, but we must know how to deal with it. And so God's presence gives us the ability to choose. God's presence also gives us the ability to run. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 22 says this, Run from anything that stimulates youthful lust. Instead, pursue righteous living, faithfulness, love, and peace. Enjoy the companionship of those who call on the Lord with pure hearts. So it's not just running from something. It's running to something, and that's what I see in our culture. We have become so convinced that if we just convince our students or our young people or our college-age students to run from the consequences of sexual sin, and we don't say run to this, we think that we've done our job and we haven't. God is a God of sex. He created our body with specific parts of it to absolutely enjoy sex. He wants us to do that. But we must not run from sexual sin. We must run to holiness Peace, love, righteous living. And so God was with Joseph. God is with you. Through his presence, he gives you the power of choice and the ability to run. Let's continue on in this narrative, picking up in verse 13. Here's what it says. And so it was when she saw that he had left his garment in her hand and fled outside that she called to the men of her house and spoke to them, saying, See, he has brought into us a Hebrew to mock us, he being Pharaoh. He came to lie with me, and I cried out with a loud voice. And it happened when he heard that I lifted my voice and cried out that he left his garment with me and fled and went outside. And so she kept his garment with her until the master came home. Uh (laughs) Uh-oh. Then she spoke to him with these words. The Hebrew servant whom you brought to us came into me to mock me. And so it happened as I lifted my voice and cried out that he left his garment with me and fled outside. And so it was when his master heard these words, which his wife spoke to him saying, your servant did to me after this manner, that this anger was aroused. This is a good thing. Spouses that get jealous over their 
spouses, that's okay. You belong to each other. And let me tell you something. Somebody moves in on my wife, there's going to be a price to pay. (laughs) And rightfully so. We are each other's. She is not to belong to anybody else. And so, yes, our jealousy can go too far. Yes, we can act out in sinful anger. But it is not a wrong thing to be jealous of your spouse. Look, God is jealous of us. We are his. He's not jealous of us in the sense that he wants to be us. He's jealous for us in the sense that we belong to him. And so when the Bible talks about godly jealousy, he has pursued us with a passionate love and an incredible sacrifice, and we belong to him. And when he sees us messing with other people in the world and people moving in on us, God doesn't like that. And we shouldn't either. And it's okay to think that and feel that. We belong to our spouses. We belong to God. And so Pharaoh, rightfully so, if this man has moved in on his wife, there's going to be a price to pay. The problem is his wife is not a good person, and she has slandered Joseph's name. And there are a lot of people in the church, in this room, who have been slandered, and it doesn't feel too great, does it? Does it feel good when people lie about you and say false things about you? Now, according to our laws, you can actually be sued for damages, for money, public apologies. It happens all the time. Slander is not a good thing. And have you ever asked yourself this question, why me? I mean, come on, man. Here's Joseph living his life by the book, doing everything he could possibly do to try to trust God and love God and love people. And now God lets him be placed in a situation where he is going to be falsely accused. And look, it is up to you and I to determine who is telling the truth and who is not. But here, We don't have any eyewitness testimony. We've got her word against his, and there's evidence on the scene. And look what happens. Then Joseph's master took him and put him into the prison, a place where the king's prisoners were confined, and he was there in the prison. Man, what devastating news. Can you imagine? Put yourself in his situation. Going to prison for a false accusation, stuff like this happens all the time. People accuse other people of false things, and they go to prison because of circumstantial evidence. And this is exactly what Joseph is going through. And I can't help but sympathize with Joseph. I would certainly be asking the question, God, what is your plan? I ran from sexual temptation, but you still let me go through this mess. What is going on? Well, here's the thing, guys. God's presence will give us the ability to choose. God's presence will give us the ability to run. But God's presence will also give us the opportunity and the ability to suffer. Good things come, but so do bad things. And here is Joseph, a victim of circumstantial evidence, a victim of slander, a victim of manipulation, and yet he gets the short end of the stick again. And you know what? Sometimes it happens to us. It certainly does. Here's what the Bible says in 1 Peter 4.19. So if you are suffering, suffering in a manner that pleases God, keep on doing what is right and trust your lives to the God who created you, for he will never fail you. If you're going through something and you're suffering, keep trusting in God. He will not fail you. When you do go through something and you're suffering, choose to trust in God just like Joseph because he's not going to fail you. And throughout Joseph's story, he never broke trust in God. He never lashed out. He didn't doubt. He didn't forsake the Lord. He chose to endure suffering and trust in the Lord. And that's God's will for our lives. The Bible also says this, And 1 Peter 3, 17, for it is better if it is God's will to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. I would rather be Joseph in a prison falsely accused of evil than to be in prison because I've done something evil. You with me? And so if we are going to suffer, let it be because we are trusting and following after God, not because we've been caught and now we're sad that we're caught. When it comes to the will of God, it is his will for you to endure suffering for righteousness sake and that you would continue to trust in him because he is not going to fail you and he is not going to fail Joseph. In 1 Peter chapter 2 verse 15 it says this, for it is God's will that by doing good you should silence the ignorant talk of foolish people. And so here's my prayer for us this morning. Here's my prayer for me that I would live in such a wise, righteous way that even when these accusations are brought against me or against you or against our church or against our faith, they couldn't even hold up. The foolish talk is now silenced because of the way in which we live. And so it's not just about running from sin. It's about running to righteous wise 
living. How are you living in such a way that may be pointed at you saying, oh, look at this, look at this person, look at this sin. What kind of foolish talk could take place about you and the accusation would stick? And my encouragement and suggestion to you, it is is God's will for you to live better. You know, we always make mistakes. And uh, when one person makes a mistake, when you're playing football, who suffers? The whole team, right? But look at Joseph. Who's on his team? He's gone. He's alone. He has no family. And look, if one person is suffering in this church, we do have each other. Use that. It is God's will that you would use each other. And that's what we read in 1 Thessalonians. Enjoy the presence of the Lord's people. That is God's will for your life. Let's finish this story, picking up in verse 21. It says, But the Lord was with Joseph in the prison and showed him his faithful love. (laughs) Well, this is a nice way of showing me love, God. God's presence is there. And it says, And the Lord made Joseph a favorite with the prison warden. And before long, the warden put Joseph in charge of all the other prisoners and over everything that happened in the prison. And the warden had no more worries because Joseph took care of everything. And the Lord was with him and caused everything he did to succeed. This is what I admire so much about Joseph, is that even when he gets placed in bad circumstances and situations, he makes the most of it. And that is God's will for his life. And that is God's will for ours. Maybe you're stuck in a bad family just like Joseph. Make the most of it. Maybe you're stuck in a bad relationship just like Pharaoh's wife with Joseph. Make the most of it. Maybe your marriage stinks. Maybe your family's destroyed. Maybe you can't stand your job. Maybe you can't even stand church or the place that you worship. Make the most of it. Do the best that you possibly can. That is God's will for your life. That is his plan. And so I'll end with this final thought. Experiencing God's presence in the pain gives me the ability to understand his love and trust his hand in my life. Why? Because through the good and the bad, I can trust his heart. And that's what I come back to. God, I trust your hand. I trust what you are providentially doing or what you're permitting and allowing because I trust who you are. It is ultimately God's plan that we would trust him.